In the 1980s and 90s, Dennis McKinsey put out a monthly newsletter called Biblical Errancy, in which he presented all the contradictions and problems in the Bible. Eventually, these newsletters became a book called The Encyclopedia of Biblical Errancy. This book is probably the most comprehensive work of its kind that exists. Granted, it's biased against the Bible. It treats every apparent contradiction as an actual contradiction, and gives little credence to Christian explanations, even though on some issues, in my opinion, these explanations are acceptable. Nevertheless, the book is a welcome antidote to the prevailing pro-Bible bias that is so much a part of our culture. In 2009, Dennis died of cancer. I personally feel a deep sense of loss because we were kindred spirits. We shared a passionate conviction that the Bible needs to be exposed as the primitive nonsense it is. That people need to be educated as to what the Bible actually says, as opposed to the whitewashed versions that everybody gets in Sunday school. Certainly there are some excellent ideas in Christianity, but as a basic overall belief system, as a valid worldview, Christianity is, in my opinion, the biggest intellectual scam in history. Dennis, I would say, favored atheistic humanism. I myself favor Unitarianism. But we certainly both oppose the worldview of the Bible as a comic book version of reality. Dennis appeared on many radio programs in the 80s and 90s debating the Bible with Christians. I present here some of the most interesting excerpts from these programs. Chapter 1. McKinsey's goal. Yes, what I'm really trying to do in the, uh, for, you know, on my publication and so forth is I'm trying to present another point of view. I'm trying to present the other side. The American people are essentially receiving a one-sided presentation of the Bible. They're hearing all the pros and none of the cons. And all you have to do is turn on your radio or television, hear your TV preachers, or get some of their literature and so forth, and you'll see it's all about how the God, Bible is God's Word. The Bible says this. The Bible says that. And uh, there's so much information that people are not being made aware of. Balance is badly needed. Well, you know, we have balance in politics to a large extent. You turn on your TV, your radio, and you'll hear people debating politics day in and day out as to who's, what's correct and what isn't. And yet you don't hear people debating the Bible or something, something which I consider more fundamental. Because most of the people, or not most, a large number of people go to the political realm out of the Bible. Their, their attitude toward abortion, their attitude toward uh, creationism, their attitude toward nuclear weapons, and a whole host of other problems comes right out of the Bible. Uh, it's, they're following what the Bible, they feel the Bible teaches them. On another program, Dennis said, The problem all these people are making, they don't seem to realize it, is they're comparing everything with the Bible, and they never stop to think about comparing the Bible with the Bible. Is the book consistent? Look at the book internally. Does it agree with itself? Does it say the same thing in Mark as it does in James? My entire publication in the last 45 issues is to prove that one basic point. The book doesn't even agree with itself, so how could it possibly agree with the outside world and anything that's going on? Chapter 2. Was Noah sinless? I think it's crucially important to understand that comparing biblical passages for consistency is not debating how many angels can fit on the head of a pen. It is establishing whether the Bible is a divinely inspired work or not. The entire edifice of Christianity cannot be legitimate if it rests on a foundation rife with contradictions. Here Dennis debates Christians on a basic contradiction. The Bible says all have sinned, yet it also claims Noah was perfect. I have a specific statement. Romans 3.23 says, For all sin comes short. Everybody knows the phrase. And Genesis 6.9 says, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Now, how do you reconcile those two? I have no problem with that at all. Okay, how? Because every man is created by God and he is a human person. And every man is going to be a sinner because he is a human being. Now, you are pulling a scripture out about this other person in the Old Testament in a statement and saying that this contradicts that all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't make any contradiction at all. But see, you want it to be 
made a comment. Well, you keep making statements and you're not providing evidence, sir. You, you're, you said the same thing about three different times in four different ways. And I still ask, how do you reconcile the word perfect with all of sin? I repeat my question. How do you, if, if Noah is perfect, how can he be a sinner? Hello? Only because, and, and this is all I'm going to say about it, only because that statement doesn't necessarily say that Noah was not a sinner. Says he's perfect? Does not say that. That statement does not say that Noah was not a could you look up the word perfect in a dictionary, sir? I think you'll find it means without uh, without imperfections. Well... I, I don't know how you can reconcile the two. I'm just saying that you cannot take that scripture and say that it contradicts Romans 3.23. That, well, it clearly does, sir. And well, another thing is you keep saying... You're saying it does, and I'm saying it doesn't, so you can't prove yourself any any better than I can okay, me. We'll leave it up to the audience. The Let's leave it up to the audience to make the judgment. What's the point? The point is... That I could do the same thing you're doing on this program. I could come on there and I could take certain portions of Scripture, certain portions of the Bible, and say that they contradict with other portions of the Bible by pulling it what I want, what it says, just what I wanted to use. The, uh, now, as far as Romans 3.23 and God saying, or the Old Testament saying that Noah was a just and perfect man, you would have to go into the original language to see just exactly what the interpretation of that word perfect in that particular case was. It does not contradict the fact yeah, that all sins come short of the glory. I have done that, sir. I went back to the Hebrew, and it does mean the word perfect as we interpret it today. So there is there is no way to reconcile these two statements. As I mentioned in the last program, this is the problem you get into when you have a book written over about a 2,500-year period by 40 to 50 different writers, a few of whom seem to be very concerned about what somebody else is saying. On another program, Dennis debated the same issue with a Christian professor who is familiar with the original languages. This professor claimed perfect in Hebrew meant spiritually mature, not sinless. Dennis responded that, first of all, it's the same Hebrew word used in Deuteronomy 32.4 to describe God's work as perfect. Secondly, why was Noah allowed on the ark if he was not sinless? He had no more right to be saved from the flood than the rest of the world's sinners. And besides, if the word perfect properly means spiritually mature, why didn't the groups of experts who translated all the various versions of the Bible use the term spiritually mature rather than the word perfect? Personally, what I like to do on this issue is to bring up a related contradiction where there is less dispute over the meaning of a word. Romans 3.10, where it says, There is none righteous, no, not one. Compared to Genesis 7.1, where God calls Noah righteous. Chapter 3, Figurative Interpretation. Hi, my name is Chuck. Um, tonight I've just listened to a few minutes of the program, and it seems to me that a lot of the um, questions this gentleman has about contradictions and such that deal with how the Bible was written. And I just wanted to ask the man if, if, he, if he believes that the Bible was just a series of interpretations by, by fallible human beings about an infallible being, about God, someone who is perfect. And aren't we going to find with these interpretations that there will be contradictions, not because God is contradictory, but because man and his views are? Okay, that's a defense that's some, made some, by some scholars, sir, that, the, uh, um, <clears throat> that in effect we've had copious errors, that somebody has written something in the book incorrectly. And the point I would make is that uh, this brings into question the entire book. If any part of the book is uh, fallacious, then this really uh, brings into question the entire book. How do you know what's true if you admit that certain parts of it are false? Uh, I don't really see that uh, w once you go down the road of assuming the Bible has validity, in effect, you have to take the book as is. Uh, in that sense, I'd agree with the fundamentalists, because you can't start saying, well, I agree with this, and I won't agree with that, and this is why uh, you end up with 1,500 separate Christian denominations, because everybody is making essentially their own interpretation. You can't assume that the book is uh, written by uh, infallible men, uh, fallible men writing an infallible book. I mean, you're trying to have it both ways. I mean, it really doesn't matter to me whether you claim the book is fallible, therefore you admit there's errors in it, or you claim it's infallible and there are no errors in it. All I'm saying is you can't do both simultaneously. And let me just ask you, what 
is your response to people who say, well, all of this is fine and good, but really the Bible is just allegorical and, and just exists to teach us lessons and give us uh, some sort of guidance? Um, well, I would have actually two two or three uh, responses to that. One is uh, allegorical or otherwise it would still be uh, a contradiction. That is to say, you can't have one part of the book telling you one thing, another one telling you precisely the opposite. Um, that would be my first response. Secondly, um, Jesus himself says that the, many of the events in the Old Testament actually occurred. For instance, if you say that the story of um, Lot and his wife between the pillar of salt, or the story of Noah and the flood, or the uh, Adam and Eve account, if you say these are allegorical and they actually did not occur, physically occur, then really what you're doing is you're saying Jesus made a false statement. Uh, in other words, I would say they couldn't be allegorical because Jesus says they're not allegorical. Chapter 4, Hell, Jesus' Worst Teaching Here a person calls in and gives what I consider a very good critique of the doctrine of hell, followed by a brief, pathetic response by a Christian professor. I've been thinking a lot lately about uh, judgment and I've been thinking about the goodness of God, too. And I've been, a, a problem has occurred to me, and, and I thought, well, I, obviously a lot of people aren't truly saved, and these people will be going to hell. And hell, or so am I, I am told, consists of eternal torment in flames or in some other measure. Well, my main problem with that is, like, if you have a good, a good parent, in fact, an extremely good parent, when he punishes a child, he says, you know, the ideal thing he's supposed to be at least feeling, if not saying, is, is that this hurts me more than it hurts you. And that the reason that they punish people, like if a kid runs out in the street, say, I may smack him on the bottom or ground him or something like that because I realize that, that I'm doing something that hurts him but it's for his later good. In other words, it's a correctional measure. Now, if we punish people, if God is punishing these people, why is, if he's going to punish them for eternity, then they won't ever have any chance to reform. So why punish them in the first place? Wouldn't it be simpler to just allow them to pass into non-existence and not grant them eternal life? It's what it seems to me is, is if I advocated that, if I had, say, if I was a person and uh, someone, and I had issued a series of decrees, if I was, say, like God, and I ordered the person to be slowly tortured for 100 years and then killed, people would say that was horrible, that was evil, that's inhumane, that's just awful. Well, isn't that the same thing? Isn't, isn't God being a sadist contemplating the torture of someone for eternity? We're not even talking about a finite length of time. That seems to me to be one of the greatest crimes in the history of thought. Okay, let's see if Mr. Warren might have a very brief comment. The uh, fact of the length of that kind of punishment that the Bible, of which the Bible speaks, and the Bible does speak of an eternal hell, an eternal time of torment, that is true. Uh, it really shows something of the hideousness of sin and the holiness of God. Chapter 5, Christian Characters. I've talked, as I say, with various ministers, various groups. Uh, as long as the situation is one where there's no animosity. Uh, in other words, there are two things that I really feel that shouldn't be there. One is profanity or name-calling or arguments directed toward a person. And secondly, a profanity or anything of that sort. As long as it's a calm, dispassionate discussion, excellent. I'll show up any place, any time. Editorial comments. I wouldn't say the rudeness of the ensuing Christians is typical, but neither would I say it's atypical. Uh, then my first question was going to ask how much education did this Mr. McKenzie have, and but he's already told me that, so... One, there are several points I'd like to make. Well, uh, excuse me for interrupting you, but what education were you talking about? He did state he was a school teacher. Are you talking about education from that standpoint or education of the Bible? In the first place, before anybody understands the Bible, you have to have a working knowledge of the Greek language because it was written uh, partly in, it was in the times of the Armenian 
Gulf language was used and the Greek language. Many words in the Greek language do not have the same meaning as the meaning in our English language. Now, uh, okay, in, the, in the second place, another point I want to make. Let's, let's let him respond to the first one here. Uh, let me respond first to my credentials, uh, question my education. I have a, a bachelor's degree in the philosophy and a master's degree in the social sciences. I've taught for about 10 years and uh, been in another field for about seven or eight years. And okay. most of the time I've spent reading on my own. So okay. You're asking, and with regard to your second uh, point about the Greek and the Hebrew, uh, yes, I, when I talk with ministers, they will usually use that same uh, argument. You oh, have to go back it's, to. it's not an argument. It, it's a question of the meaning of words in, in different language, and, and, and that's a fact. Well, now, w w one other point I would like to make. Um, what, what could I respond uh, to that, please? If, if they, when we read the Bible, excuse me, you just, are excuse, thinking excuse as... Excuse me just a moment. Yes. Dennis? Yes. You're going to have to learn to stick up for yourself the way uh, we all do on this program. You're going to have to jump in there and get your own uh, words in. If you want to respond to something, you're going to have to do your best to get it in. Okay. Well, I, I don't want to be rude, but she, she's not letting me, she's asking me a serious question. I understand. She's not letting me respond. I understand. Uh, now, about the Greek and the Hebrew, ma'am, if, uh, if you sit down with uh, four or five versions, the uh, Revised Standard, the King James, the New American Standard, the American Standard, and so forth, if all of these uh, books and chap uh, translate a particular verse the same way, you can be quite sure that that's what the Greek says. Now, if you're uh, saying that the scholars don't know how to translate, that's a whole new issue. But I'm uh, saying when you have... Sir, yeah, sir, yeah. wait yeah. just a minute. I'm speaking of the meaning of the words in the Greek Ma'am, nobody denies that Listen, there are differences. Listen, I'm not talking to you, Jerry. I'm talking to somebody else. <laughs> This next argument I wouldn't even bother trying to follow. Just note how Christian apologists like to speak in paragraphs, and they object to any kind of timely interjection that points out a false step in their reasoning. Instead of engaging in Socratic dialogue, they like to present a theological fait accompli. In other words, they like to preach at you without interruption. Here, Dennis was having none of it. All right, any comment, Dr. Ruckman? We have to be quiet just a minute. He put in two that time instead of one. In regard to the first question, he was talking about why is Christ's resurrection different from the rest, and the answer is extremely simple. Anybody who read their Bible knew all the rest of them died again. I hear that all the time, Peter, but that's not what Paul said. Paul said it's the resurrection. Now, ho, ho, now just shut your mouth while I'm through, fella. Pardon? I'll shut my mouth to you through. Be a challenge if you can't do anything else. I, I'm sorry, I can't even hear you. Trang before I was interrupted. Lazarus came up from the dead and died again. Jonah came up from the dead and died again. Eutychus came up from the dead of God then. The widow's son came up and died again. When Christ came up, he didn't come up to die again. Oh, well, well, let me, I have two answers to that. First, nothing in the book says those people died again, but let's assume they did. The main point is... Hey, shut up a minute. You asked two questions. I have a right to answer two questions. You put a clean ass on us too. Now, before you go hop, skip, and jumping to something else in order to cover up the mess you made, I will have a chance to answer the mess. Well, you're, you're creating the mess by telling us something that's not relevant to what we're talking about. Oh. Paul said, Paul said the resurrection is... Watch that big mouth. Be a gentleman if you can't be anything else. Now, I held my peace while you talk. Now, bud, you hold your peace while I talk. As of the earth, is such a day that are earthy, and as the heavenly, such are also they that are heavenly. Now, I'm talking about the fact that there's no verse that said it is. Well, I'm not quite through yet. Just, just patient, buddy. But you're, you're, well, I'm talking about the point that Paul made is whether that's important or not. But granted, the verses that say are implied that he lived on afterwards. Just watch your big mouth till I'm through, fella, and I can wait for you, and you can wait for me. So he said this corrupt must put in corruption. Okay, if you wouldn't be so patronizing. I'm not, I didn't get through it. That means that Christ is alive, waiting to give me a body just like his. And you could not say this of anybody who was resurrected in the Old Testament. Now. But if you haven't answered the question, where does Paul say that's the key element, the fact that Jesus rose, did not die again? Paul says it's the resurrection that counts. So there is no way out of this dilemma. Are you all through? Yes. All right, I'll take you out of it. The Bible doesn't say that God created the devil at all, not just something the fellow gets from not reading his Bible. The Bible says God created anointed cherub who was perfect in his ways until the day the iniquity was found in him. Well, I know that. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey, now, wait a minute. Watch that big mouth. I kept my mouth shut for you. Now, if you don't remember this broadcast, fella, you're going to act like a Christian even if you're not one and shut your mouth for the other guy is through. Oh, well, I'm not going to take directions from 
for you, Peter. It's been a waste of your waste of time. Chapter 6, The Narrow Point of View of Christians For some radio appearances like this one, Dennis used the pseudonym of Jim Wentz. Here he's on with the host and a Christian minister named Gaston. Note how Christians are often so immersed in their religion, they are unable to stand back and see the broader picture. The Bible itself is being questioned, and they resort to citing the Bible's own claims for itself. They don't see that's no better than saying, the Quran is true because, see, it says so right here in the Quran. First of all, I'm not going to argue because uh, according to the Bible, we're not to argue. Uh, and if they, men want to get their Bibles and read in uh, 1 Corinthians 14.33, it says, uh, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And uh, I think they're just arguing the word, and I'm sure this doesn't make the Lord happy at all. And also in uh, 1 Corinthians um, 14.40, it says, I don't have my classes with me, I'm, uh, let all things be done in uh, decent, uh, done decently and in order. Well, what's wrong with this? We're decent, we're in order? You may be decent, but you're, uh, it's not right to argue the word of God. And if someone made the statement, if uh, a good person, all you do is be good, go to heaven, well, I feel sorry for them people. In the Bible it says there's one way to go to heaven, lest a man be saved, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. A good person, this is really sad. Because people, there are really super good people in this world, but unless they've accepted Christ as their Savior, and they know this beyond the shadow of a doubt, I'm sorry, they won't go to heaven. Yeah, see, that's, yeah, your, that's, that's your that's opinion. What, right. I, yeah, I mean, this, this, is my, this isn't my word, this is God's word. Yeah, yeah but see, what's, what the debate here is, again, Lois, is that we have someone in the room who says it's not God's word. I mean, well, to, to try to argue him by saying it is God's word because I said so does not solve the argument. Okay, well, I, I don't want, like I say, I don't want to argue because we're not to argue God's word, but this person says this isn't the way. Well, the only thing I can say in closing is when he stands before his maker, then he'll know. But by then it may be too late, and then I would really feel sorry for him, and I, I pray for that man that he will see the Lord and accept him as Savior before it's too late, because once uh, we've made cross that little bridge or, uh, you know, go over that river, it's too late. Hey, and, ma'am, the book says... Not, uh, uh, hold on, Lois. You're ignoring your own book. It says, prove all things and contend for the faith. And uh, Gaston, I think, is doing trying to do that. Or oh, if you're just running off, thank you. Uh, but no, I appreciate the fact that you're here. You'd be surprised how hard it is to find people willing to defend this book. Uh, and you know, I talk to Mormons, Jehovah's all. Witnesses, uh, and people like. Hold on, Lois. People are speaking. When I talk to Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and other people, I get them into my house, and uh, you know, I try to get, keep the conversation going. And after about a half an hour, the first thing they want to do is leave. They, I can't. It's very difficult to retain people. In a conversation, when you're bringing up good arguments, like I feel like I'm doing, uh, if it's, well, then if it's, again, they're they're adhering to a book that tells them essentially to avoid people like you. Well, well but it also well, says well, to like the faith and prove all things. I'd like to ask Lois what Jude three means when it says and commands us right. contend earnestly contend for the faith. faith once for all delivered to the saints. How are you going to contend for it if you don't argue? I agree with him. There uh, you're, you're contradicting the word of God, and we're not. Now he's he, quoting he the word of God. Right, okay, and so am I. In Corinthians, uh, well, then what you're suggesting is that there are contradictions. Right. Which is what Jim Lenz is here to say, and you're saying right. he has no business saying it. Just prove my point. <laughs> well, I just I think a lot, of, a lot of this confusion and a lot of this uh, bickering back and forth over the Word of God is nothing but the work of the devil. And he loves it. Now, the only person you make happy in, in conversations like this is the devil. The Lord isn't happy over it. But, ma'am, you're taking a very uh, narrow point of view that uh, uh, you have the way, the truth, and the light. And, uh, you know, other religions can say the same thing. The Quran clearly shows the state. The, the, yeah, but the Quran clearly states anybody who believes in the Trinity is going to hell. That's a blasphemous concept. I just got through reading it to, to Gaston a few minutes ago off the air. And uh, so you're taking a chance. You know, people say I'm taking a chance. They're taking a chance. Chapter 7, Dennis's Own Morality. Um, again, a, que a questions of faith. You said all things a few moments ago. Uh, are, prove all uh, things. Uh, yeah, prove all things. But you, before that, you said all things are, uh, eventually come down to questions of faith. Or whether it's a, a question in science, whether it's uh, your existence yourself, it's meaning. Uh, for you, how do, have you determined it? Uh, what, what, is, uh, what is meaningful to you as an individual? Well, uh, how do you answer some of the great questions that we've talked about here for yourself? What is the meaning of life for you? What is the meaning of life? Yeah, I mean, why are you here, do you think? I don't have any idea. I don't think anybody else does either. 
In fact, I know nobody else does. I mean, they give a lot of reasons. Well, I'm just talking it's, about it's, you. I mean, uh, personally, why do you get up in the morning? What motivates you to do life? Well, I enjoy uh, improving what I see around me every day and contributing mm -hmm. what I can. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, as far as a minister once questioned my morality, he didn't even know me. And he said, mm -hmm. uh, I said, well, I would assume that I feel... I can't prove it, but I would uh, say that uh, I'm probably as moral as anybody in your congregation. I don't smoke, yeah. I don't cuss, I don't yeah. drink, I don't do any... Mm -hmm. Anybody knows me will vouch for that. I, mm -hmm. uh, I lead a quite uh, upright, upstanding life. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, uh, in fact, when I'm around people who do those things, I'm, uh, mm -hmm. I get quite offended. What, what is, uh, do you think, the purpose of life? The purpose of life, I would say, is to help and improve your fellow man. Why? Because I feel that... Uh, well, again, if you're expecting reward sometime in an afterlife for doing the right, I don't see there's any reward. Just do it because it's right, and it's the right thing to do. I don't expect anything well, out of it. How do you determine if something's right to do? How do I determine what's, if something, I mean, where does morality come from? Yeah, where does, you, where does your own personal morality come from? I think you can just see it. You can see that lying and cheating and stealing and so forth. I don't need a book to tell me that stealing and lying and cheating are wrong. Anybody who uh, you know, operates in daily life can see that that's something wrong with that. Why, why not? Uh, why, if this, is, if this is all there is, if we only get one crack at it and, we, and one, once we die it's all over with, why not live for yourself? Well, a lot of people think that way, but I feel that uh, if you're brought up in the right frame of mind, a person won't think that way. Well, where does that right frame of mind come from? Why not? What, what's, what's wrong with a totally hedonistic life and get what, get, well, getting is good? Well, because of, first it leads to a breakdown in society, and I think in the long so run, what? it destroys it's, yourself. So, so oh, oh, okay. So it's, in what way? Well, I think the person who drinks a lot is going to pay the price in the long okay. run. If smokes a lot, he's going to pay a price. You don't get uh, something okay. for nothing, and I think that's a lot of people. I think if people, if they live in a daily life, they'll find out uh, the easiest way in the short run is the hardest way in the long run, and the hardest way in the short run is the easiest way in the long run. <laughs> if you can follow me that, I should tell Students I used to work with, uh, they wouldn't clean up the lockers and so forth. I said, if you keep it neat and orderly every day, in the long run, you'll find that's the easiest way to go. I see. Okay. All right. So it's sort of a pragmatic look at, uh, just through observation, common sense approach. Correct. Chapter 8, The John Otto Show. So you're just going to spend the rest of your life trying to tear down something you, know, you don't even believe in anyway? Well, I'm not... It's not a matter of tearing down, it's a matter of bringing out a lot of information. No, you know, you do more damage, you send more people to hell than you do any good at all, because all you're trying to do is disprove the Bible. That's all, you, that's all your goal is in life, is yeah. to disprove the Bible. So what you're going to do is put more doubt in the people's mind rather than help people and direct them, because the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Bible teaches us the way of salvation. Oh. The Bible does not teach you uh, that. Sir. You just told me how to get saved from the Bible. That's what the book says. That doesn't mean it's true. Well, well, why are you spending your whole life trying to just get people to disbelieve the Bible? Why don't you just disbelieve it and leave everybody else alone? No, I feel that people should be made aware of the problems within it. But right? they, have, they have a mind that they can make up for themselves. Well, not if I uh, go to Sunday school and hear a totally one-sided presentation that thousands and thousands of people do. Who out there is giving another t a side to this book? Who's giving the uh, cons rather than just the pros? Mm -hmm. It's very, I think, it's very risky when you have millions of people in this country receiving a totally one-sided presentation of anything. Well, let me ask you Sociology, it. religion, or politics, or whatever. You know why? You just don't understand. You know why? Because you're not safe. Let's, let's do one of the basic uh, contradictions as set forth and see if, see if it is, in fact, a contradiction. Well, we're dealing good in generalities. Let's do one specific. Well, I was going to, I was going to say, suggest Exodus 33:20, and he said, Thou canst not see my face, or man shall not see me and live. All right, in Genesis 32:30, yeah. 30, it says, A man says, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And yeah, he's an angel of the Lord. 20, I've seen God. He, every time you have an appearance of an angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it was an appearance of Jesus Christ. Because it couldn't be God, or it would be a contradiction. He says seeing God with a capital G, that's taken to be Jehovah, you know, the very big... Well, whenever you talk about Jesus Christ, or God is capital. When it talks about in John, in chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, then, what does it mean when it says, in your interpretation, No man shall see, look upon the face of God and live? What does that mean? Well, I believe in the Old Testament, if they would have saw God face huh. to face, they would have died. Yeah, the but, glory of God or his face. I don't know exactly what it means by his uh, face. Well, you're trying to cite that as a contradiction. Of course, where exists a contradiction, one or the other version is untrue. There's got to be 
which which would mean that there are untruths in the Bible. But you're not willing to concede that. Okay, let me explain it this way, all right? Uh, yeah, we, right, okay. we got to pick up on some other calls. Go right ahead, yeah. I, uh, I'll quit on this, okay? Okay. I just want to get this out because it's important. Yes. The Bible talks about being born again. You have to be a child of God. It says you are, you are a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, God points out in his word that the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, okay? Mm -hmm. The reason people can't understand the Bible or, it see, or they, they look through it and see all the seemingly contradictions because they have no understanding of the Bible because they have not the Holy Spirit inside them. It's that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'll just read a couple of verses because I don't want to take long. It says, oh. it says, but then... Uh, I hear this first. Well, wait a minute, let me just finish this. Well, okay, you'll know, we have to do it in some haste, because we got it. It says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Right? Ah, I see. Okay, very good, we we got a break. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, yes, you wanted to add, uh, Dennis, something. I hear that verse virtually every time I'm on the radio. Do you really? Oh, what? yes, I, I could put that backwards and forward. But the, what they're really saying is, you have to get into the Bible... Accept the Bible is true. If you accept the Bible is true, you have the Holy Spirit. You accept that is true, then you'll see it's true. Oh, I see. Circular argument. Uh, yeah, yeah, precisely. One of Dennis's favorite arguments was to present a list of the horrendous things the biblical God does. He creates evil. Evil comes from the Lord. He deceives. Uh huh. He tells people a lie. He makes false statements. He rewards liars. He orders men to become drunken. He rewards the fool and the transgressor. He delivers a man, in this case Job, into Satan's hands. He mingles a perverse spirit. He's not omnipotent, which means he isn't all-powerful. He causes indecency. He spreads dung on people's faces. He orders stealing. He makes false prophecies. He changes his mind. He causes adultery. He orders the taking of a harlot. He kills people. He orders the killing of people. He has a temper. He's often jealous. He's not omnipresent, which means he isn't everywhere. He's not omniscient, which means he doesn't know all. He repents. He practices injustice. Mm. He plays favorites. He sanctions slavery. He degrades deformed people. He punishes bastards for being illegitimate. He punishes many for the acts of one. He punishes children for their father's sins. He punishes a man for following his orders. He prevents people from hearing his words. He supports human sacrifices. He orders cannibalism. He demands virgins as a part of war plunder. He orders gambling. He orders horses to be hamstrung. He requires an unbetrothed virgin to marry her seducer. He sanctions the violation of the enemy's women. He sanctions the beating of slaves to death. Editorial comments. I think this particular one is a good example of Dennis's overreaching. I'm pretty sure the Bible does not sanction the beating of slaves to death. It sanctions the beating of slaves almost to death. Exodus 21, 20 to 21, quote, If a man beats his male or female slave with a rod, and the slave dies as a direct result, he must be punished. But he is not to be punished... If the slave gets up after a day or two, since the slave is his property. Unquote. He requires a woman to marry her rapist. He teaches war. He orders the cooking of food with human feces. He killed the righteous and the wicked. He intentionally gave out bad laws. He, ex he excused the sins of prostitutes and adulterers. He excused the murder and promised him protection. He killed a man and refused to impregnate his sister-in-law. He aided rather than punished a swindler. He doesn't see all. He's often indecisive. He breaks up families. In order to killing of women and children, he killed over 50,000 people because a few looked into an ark. He gives unlimited eternal punishment for limited sins, and he often violated his own laws, one of which is in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not kill. And I don't know of anybody in the entire Old Testament that did more killing than God. Oh, boy. I expect a bolt of lightning to come through this studio any moment and do me in, I think, probably. I wonder what... Well... I mean, they make uh, the God Jehovah, the writers, they seem clearly to have been influenced by the stories of the gods of, uh, of the Grecians and the gods of the Romans. I mean, to say that they were whimsical, wrathful, narrow-minded, uh, brutal. Uh, Jupiter and uh, the gods of Olympia, uh, Olympus, you know, they were, they were uh, gods like this God that's described in the Bible. You know, uh, Jesus doesn't look too much better in the Bible uh, in many ways. Oh, boy, if we get on that. He, uh, we, he made quite a few errors himself. Uh, if, we, if we get on that, I'll tell you, Dennis, we, we may not survive the night. I, I mean to say, we, boy, Jesus is subject to error? Oh, yes, he made 
probably more than anybody in the Bible outside of possibly Paul. Oh, golly. Who, who just just one choice one if you could. Huh. He says, he tells people in uh, Matthew 5.22, don't people call people fools, call people fools, you're in danger of hell fire. Uh, let me read the exact verse. Uh, again, you know, I like to be uh -huh. definite, uh, specific. It says, but so whosoever say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. You just don't go around calling people that. Yet he himself does it. He does it in Matthew 23, 17, 23, 19, Luke 11, 20. He says, ye fools and blind. He calls people fools on many occasions. Also, he says, uh, uh, while he's on the cross, he tells the thief, uh, today you shall be with me in paradise. Uh, that's not possible since he supposedly was died, he died and was buried uh, and on the third day he rose. Yeah, yeah, I see. So yeah. it wouldn't be that day with him in paradise. Yeah, now that, oh, that's interesting. This day you shall be with me in paradise. And and he was left for three days before uh, being, before rising again. Yeah, I see, I see, yeah. And, and, you know, I, must remember, I must remember that. Now, that's a classic example of a contradiction. It would seem to be uh, quite clear that the Lord um, had, had to defer on his promise for about three days. Right. Yeah. Right, because he's three days and three nights in the yeah. heart of the earth. You can't be today with him in paradise. Yeah. As far as women, uh, the lady bringing up the expression of women, the role of women in the Bible clearly is secondary to men. They're not too much above that of a slave. Uh, the number of verses is astronomical. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says, The head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. Clearly, just as we are secondary to Christ, the men are secondary to Christ. Women are secondary to men. Well, people live the way they were supposed to, and if they believed the book the way they're supposed to, they wouldn't have a problem with that. That the men, that the men are the, at the head of the women. Right. Well, oh. yeah, it says, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither oh. was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Oh. Not only secondary to men, but they were oh. created for men. That's like right. That's what the Bible says. Pardon? Oh. The woman was created for the man. That's right. I mean, why well, <laughs> That's what? like using women as a toy. What's wrong with saying, come here, you wench? That sort of thing any longer, you know. So. Again, a man who loves the Lord and fears the Lord and believes the Word to be the Word of God wouldn't do something like that. Wouldn't, wouldn't say, come here, you wench. No, but the, what the man is like. The fact is, you have to serve him if he's a devil and he's a drunk. Well, I'm sorry, but a man who believes God and who believes his Word to be his Word wouldn't go and get drunk. Uh -huh. I don't understand how, what, is, what difference does it make what the husband is like? The fact is, the book says you're to serve him. He could be the most ornery scoundrel that ever walked. The book clearly says you're to serve him. It says, wives, Ephesians 5.22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. In other words, just as you serve the Lord, that's the way you serve your husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. I don't know how much clearer it can be. Chapter 9, The Doctrine of Original Sin. Why are we being punished for what Adam did? He ate Why are we being fruit. punished? We huh? are being, because, the Bible says because of one man, death can power all of us, but because of one man, Jesus Christ, we can all have salvation. Well, we can all live. Now you're talking about how to get out of the problem. I want to know how we got into the problem if God is just. We got into the problem because of Adam. Right, so we're being punished for what he did. Right, God is just. That's why we're being punished. We're, we're being punished for what somebody did 2,000 or 6,000 years ago, and that's justice? That's right. God is a holy God. That, there's no justice there whatsoever. That makes about as much sense. If I was sitting home watching, listening to the radio one evening, the police came and arrested me, and I said, what am I being arrested for? They said, well, your father out in California just shot and killed somebody. And I said, well, what's that? Happen? They said, well, he's your father, isn't he? Uh, I you know, I don't mean to be rude. I hope I'm not. But the thing is, there is justice in that. You know what the justice is? The justice is he sent Jesus Christ, his son, to die for us. No, and because that, of his justice, that, I can now have salvation. Wait a minute. Now you've got another injustice. We're being punished for what Adam did. And now you've got uh, Jesus being punished for what we did. It, so the two wrongs don't make a right. Chapter 10, Speeches to Humanist Groups. Here Dennis makes a good point on how religion in some countries aids oppressors by preaching submissiveness. Then he follows with strategies on how to bring about change. It's a person that gave one back to Latin American situation. If somebody has their foot on your neck, and I come up to you and I say, love your brother, and he puts on my neck, my reaction is fine, he just tell me his foot on my neck. And he says, peace, brother, be peaceful. Fine, just tell me his foot on my neck. 
And when you, you, everything you say, you, know, you got you to endure. You got to put up with this situation. The better world's coming. My attitude's look fine. Just get your foot off my neck. <laughs> I have to, so, and the religious person's preaching this. I'm making this very simple. <clears throat> He's aiding the guy that has his foot on your neck. I might add, uh, a couple nights ago, I talked to Farrell Till. He's a former Church of Christ minister. He was a Church of Christ minister for 12 years. He's a subscriber of my publication. He also has his own publication called The Skeptical Review, which he puts out in Illinois. And we, he made precisely the same point. Uh, he mentioned, uh, he gave me one example of the person who received, uh, just this year, the National Honor from the Freedom from Religion Foundation as their model citizen for the year. Uh, he mentioned the person's name, I can't remember at this time. But anyway, he said what he did was he got a, uh, I think it was a crash or something off a courthouse lawn or some, someplace in, in uh, Illinois. And uh, I said, well, what was wrong with that? And the Pharaoh said, well, the problem was it made all the fundamentalists and all the religious crowd matter than ever. So they went around all over the town putting up crashes everywhere. In other words, he magnified the problem instead of getting rid of it. It's the idea, I believe, is to show them the error of their ways. First, you must show people the error of their ways by debunking their fundamental beliefs and then demonstrate the correctness of yours, of yours before real progress is possible. Changing minds, deprogramming, and that's what this amounts to, restructuring what people learn in Sunday school as children is basic, if not axiomatic. Another big error I find that many people make in a free thought movement is a Jehovah's Witness or Mormon come up to the door, they'll start giving the, you know, the Mormon and the, uh, the other guys start giving them a speech. And, uh, and then uh, you'll give them a few cute little, a uh, uh, free thought person will give a few smart answers, and the person will leave, and the free thought person will think, oh, I won that one, he sure didn't convert me to anything. You didn't win, you lost. You had an opportunity, you had a poor lost soul brought up the door that you could have changed, <laughs> influenced. And, and, uh, and you had your opportunity, and you blew it. Because here's a guy probably never again, rarely, in the, you know, maybe two or three times in his entire life, I have an opportunity to hear some rational uh, critiques or criticisms of the Bible instead he walked off so you didn't win you win when you actually he doesn't change you you change him because I get these people in my house I don't let them go you know I bought both the door and sealed the place up and uh, they know it's happened after about half an hour because they start crawling for the door and I hold their feet and everything and uh, you just don't let them get away you got to lay all this stuff on them and uh, I'll leave, they'll leave and I'll call them up and they won't come back and some of them will go up the door and hand me some literature and run but uh, it's really kind of comical at times uh, so don't be satisfied with just fending them off. Go out of your way to actually convert these people. They, they, they've got the numbers. They've got the people. We don't. So we have to grow stronger by reducing their numbers, and that means we have to convert people to our side. We don't have any option. A lot of ministers really sincerely believe in what they're preaching. I don't question their motives because I don't know what they are. Well, I don't really care what their motives are. The fact is they're selling bogus merchandise. They're like used car sales. They're not telling you what's wrong with the thing. We ever went to used car sales and he told you what was wrong with it. All he's going to do is play it all up for you. You know, it's great bargain, it's a great deal. And that's what the Bible thumpers well, are doing. They're that's selling this book, point. it's a bogus. These people know that there's something wrong with it and they're not telling uh, you. A lot of theological people, you're right. I've had guys admit that to me on, on, uh, not on the air. They don't say much this on the air, what the people are here, but they'll tell me they know that those contradictions are in there. I said, what do you preach this stuff for if you know what's in the book? <laughs> they, I, they don't say it, but I know what they're thinking. They're thinking is if we throw out the book, what do we got? Where's the morality of the world? I had this at a speech I gave at Ohio State University recently. That's what the students all hit me with. None of them argued with me about the book being full of holes. A bunch of them jumped on me and said, All right, what you say is true, but if we get rid of the Bible, where's our morality? When people just go out and do anything they want anytime they want to do it. I mean, that's the type of mentality you got. I said, No, they won't. The people, you know, people are doing the right because they're living in good conditions and they don't want to jeopardize them with nothing else. If you make got a good job paying fifty grand, you're pretty careful about going out and running red lights and breaking laws and doing all the other nasty stuff because you got something to lose. If the guy doesn't have anything, he can't go anywhere but up. I'm not to go out and steal. I can't go anywhere but up anyway. So I don't know what the heck. So they throw me in jail. It's a better way I live. So I'm saying improving the living conditions of people do far more to create morality in the country than throwing out the Bible because all that preaching. We have to take these people seriously because there's so many of them. Uh, you can't ignore them. You say, well, I'll live my life and they can live theirs. They can do their one. I'll do what I want. It doesn't work that way. They influence politics, which determines how you, where your tax money goes and what's put on. It determines uh, where you're going to have uh, abortions legalized or not. It determines, uh, you know, where you're going to have church 
to crash things out in front of the public buildings and things like that. The more numbers they got, the weaker we are. So the whole idea is you got to get their numbers over to us. And we can't do that by just talking to ourselves. We have to go out. That's why I have a very, uh, that's my next point. We must go on the offensive. Proselytizing is a must. I'm a firm believer in that. You just don't sit around and, and uh, talk to the people who agree with what you're saying. That's not going to get you anywhere. Don't expect them to come to you. You've got to go to them. Uh, first place, why would they come to us since they already have the truth? And this brings me to uh, the, probably the focus of my talk here today. The question is, what about those people who are uninterested in biblical criticism, under, uninterested in the biblical critique approach? That might include some people here, might include some people in, uh, well, certainly included in, in the case of the Free Thought uh, organization I spoke to three or four years ago. I have here a letter from Dan Barker of the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Now, this is an organization in Madison, Wisconsin. Dan is a very fine man who uh, is their spokesman. And he wrote the following to me. I'm going to read a little bit of this verbatim. This is going to be my up-and-coming issues. It says the following. Dear Dennis, it was nice to hear your voice again. I'm glad to know all is okay with you. Even though I agree with you that the most effective strategy is to attack the source, i.e. scripture, the Bible, we have a lot of members who are completely uninterested in biblical criticism. They don't want to change any minds, they just want to ensure that we're all free in this country to believe or disbelieve as we please. Free Thought Today, and that's his publication, is dedicated to a healthy dose of biblical criticism even though we have members who disagree with us. There are some atheists and agnostics and humanists who feel it's a waste of time or not worth much time to dig into biblical text. The Bible to them is a waste of time like the Koran to us. Who cares, they say. But I care, says Dan. Truth is truth. The world should not be allowed to pass a bunch of lies, pass off a bunch of lies as a good book, quote unquote. Dennis went on to discuss the importance of changing minds rather than focusing on the separation of church and state, which FFRF, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, tends to focus on. I think legal battles are important. They keep the issue in the news. But I think Dennis is correct that changing people's minds through reverse Sunday school is the more effective strategy. You win by focusing on the changing of minds, not by focusing on the changing or buttressing or fortifying of laws, regulations, or social customs. People run the show, laws don't. I repeat, people run the show, laws don't. Laws, and especially the Constitution, say whatever people say they say. Laws are merely a reflection of which group has the greatest resources, especially numbers and wealth. Justice is quite secondary. In fact, justice often has very little to do, little to do with what occurs. Once we have the numbers and the resources, the law will be reinterpreted accordingly. But as long as we are terribly outnumbered, and we certainly are, we aren't going to prevail regardless of what the law says. In summary, this isn't a battle against religion of the Bible. It's a much broader encounter involving a conflict between science, reason, and logic on one hand, and superstition, mysticism, and metaphysics on the other. The word religion is nothing more than a euphemism. It's a smokescreen for irrationality and blind hope for what people wish were true. The Bible has done more to hinder the progress of man than any other book ever written, and to say that it's a good, a good book is an oxymoron of the highest order. As far as its contents are concerned, an in-depth analysis to show any objective observer that the Bible is a maze, a mass, a veritable labyrinth of contradictions, inconsistencies, inaccuracies, poor math, bad science, erroneous geography, false prophecies, immoral comments, corrupt heroes, and a multitude of other problems too numerous to mention. Because I've said on many, many occasions that maybe the, <clears throat> somebody's word, but it's light years away from being a product of perfection. Thank you very much. Chapter 11, Dennis and Me. In 1993, I drove out to Ohio, and I talked to Dennis for several hours. I wanted to meet him, I wanted to compare notes, and to discuss his inflexibility on certain issues. But when I get into this book, I don't give that kind of leeway. 
If they're going to make these cranes right. nasty cleans, they got to be ready to back this stuff up because I come at them both barrels. You know that, reading all my issues. I don't give, they don't give me a quarter, I don't give me a quarter. Yes, yeah, you, 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 you had a, a guy write in years ago on one of your issues saying that suggesting for you to, to give a lot more leeway and then try to defeat them still. But in your response to that was, uh, that's not the way to go about it. It's, it's like a, a labor management battle. You go in with, with all your ammunition, you don't give any quarter. I mean, that, that roughly is what your answer was. And I tend to agree with that reader, though. That I'll, I'll give a, a fundamentalist a lot of leeway. But he'll take you apart. He's going to run all over you. You haven't debated too many fundamentals, Mickey, I can tell. Oh, I've been on the radio. I've been on the radio I don't know how many times. I debate them and uh, in, uh, they're not going to grant you anything. They, they don't even like the idea you question the book start with. The very idea that you, a moral being, you want to question God's more, uh, infallible word is ridiculous. Okay, all right. This is, an, an initial, so, this, this is on a debate. You're right. You're right. But besides talking to an individual person that you're trying to change their mind or, or try to get them to think a little bit more... Same thing. You got to first show them what's wrong with what they have. They're not going to listen to anything you got to say. They already convinced they got the truth. This is the truth right here. That's it. So until you crack the ice, and they're going to fight you on it, especially right at the beginning. They're going to fight you. You've heard, you know, you read what I put down. They're going to fight you on every little point. So you got to get a point that's so obvious, so clear, so simple, the dumbest of the dumb can see it. Yeah. And you got to hit a few of those and yeah. break the ice. Yeah. Then you get into this other stuff. You have to go back and you have to talk to these people about their basic beliefs and start all over again. you got to re-educate them. I agree. No, I, I, and I mean, yeah, that, to me, I, it's just axiomatic. They've got all this Sunday school brainwashing in them, yeah. and you've got to show them what the flaws are. They're not, they're not, they're not, once you crack that, they get to think, this book doesn't have to do yeah. I don't know where I'm going to push that creationism stuff after all in the school. Yeah. Oh, you're not, you're not get doing, no, I, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's but, common sense. Adam's death. When uh, Genesis 2.17, when uh, God promises on the day that he eats the fruit, he will die. Oh, yeah. And Spiritual or physical. Yeah. So uh, I don't see how you would convince any Christian that it, that it wasn't meant spiritually because he well, didn't die physically. Yeah, that's why the prophecy was false. They allegorize it and symbolize it and turn it into figurative language because it failed. But, but, you but he told David that his son would die. He died. Okay, but that, that's a different case. There it was, it was literal. Whereas in this case it was figurative. And just because in one case it's, it's literal doesn't mean in this case it has to be literal. In other words, you, uh, you are opting for a symbolic interpretation when he makes a clear-cut statement that could be interpreted literally much easier. Yeah, so nothing that, yeah. in the verse that justifies a, a figurative interpretation right. other than to get out of the mess. No, no, That's no. The there's, not, there's, nothing, that. there's nothing in the verse that, that says that. You're right. But then the... the, um, the I don't know what the sword I'm looking for. <laughs> the expression I was looking for was subsequent events. What happens afterwards shows that it has to be figurative because he didn't die. Well, it could be just a false prophecy. And I say, what in there justifies a figurative interpretation other than to escape the, the mess? The following events do. <laughs> yeah, but, but they didn't prepare, the following events prove it's false. They don't prove it's true. Proves it, it shows it, it has to be figurative. No, it proves you, you, it's you, false. You, you, have, you have the option of it being a literal or figurative. It's and, 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 and initially you figure, well, it's literal. But right. then when you find out Adam doesn't die, right, so it's false. Then, then it must be figurative. No, now you're assuming the book, see, you're assuming the book's Figured okay, it, all right. You're giving the book all of the, uh, I could write a book that's so silly, uh, you know, a book of mythology, for instance, about Zeus or something, and uh, you'd say, well, Zeus doesn't live on Olympus. i said, well, he's up there. He'll be up there eventually, or he's been up there. You just haven't happened to see it, or it doesn't mean an actual Zeus. It means a, uh, a Zeus in a spiritual sense. I mean, I could just go wild okay, all right, and justify all, right. all this crap I'm right. throwing together. I, I see. I know your point. But <laughs> if, if your goal is to change the mind of a fundamentalist, then you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. No. Because that, that, that particular argument, no fundamentalist is, is going to give you any... He's not going to go along with that at all. It's figurative to him, and you have to prove, you have to, prove to him that it's not figurative. But I'm saying for the people who are thinking... 
and there are a lot of Christians out there on a broad spectrum, all the way from you know the uh, Peter Rutman types who think the King James is the Bible, yes. all the way out to the Unitarians, and you know it's all down the spectrum. Okay, now some of these people you can reach; others are gone. As far as I'm concerned, they belong to mental institutions. But the other people you can reach, you, you sit there and you chop one argument after another, after another, after another, after another. I don't build my but case on one point. But, but you, but you lose points with this one because, no, because they're going to say they're going to say that's figurative. He's crazy. No, he even though you you might be right that it's it, it is not figurative. But that's what they're going to say. They're going to say, I'm not. You know, why should I listen to him? He's he's, he's taking something figurative and making it literal. So I think you, you have to come from go to where they are and try to change their mind as opposed to picking something that is a contradiction to you but I don't think it's going to be a contradiction to any Christian. To a Christian it's as clear as day that, that it has to be figurative because he didn't die. I think you're doing the right thing and uh, you know I, I disagree with some of your specific arguments. Uh, I give a lot more leeway to the opponents. <laughs> uh, but uh, th this is what needs to be done. Let's see, I got some more things that I want to Well, I think when you see uh, you give more leeway to the opponent, I think if you got out and combated these people as much as I have, your attitude would change after a while. Yeah, maybe. You aren't going to be, you're going to switch from being more, uh, less well, Mr. Nice Guy. Yeah. Well, cer Mr. certainly in a, in a debate format, so I mean, I, w I would, yeah, I would stick, yeah, I wouldn't give leeway. Uh, th a lot of times they'll come in there and slice you up uh -huh. unless you really got your. Because these people got real money at stake. If you didn't have, if you're getting to even decide the theology in the Bible, they got real bucks at stake in this thing. Most people are trying to do the right thing. They're trying to find the truth. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. They're not connivers. Yeah. They're doing what they sincerely think is right. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't convert them in 20 minutes. This is why my group probably the atheists and agnostics and humanist group. They go up, they talk to a guy for 30 minutes to say, "Well, I gave him all my best arguments. He just up and left." Didn't, didn't change at all. I'm sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, you're going to convert a guy in 30 minutes from police he's held for 30 years. Yeah, yeah. you got to give him some stuff, let him think about it, give him some more stuff later, let him think about it, just like he got Sunday school. And then and then maybe a couple years later when he has some sort of experience, he might remember what right. he said and then he might... Exactly. And won't be, won't be that the guy calls on the radio and tells me I'm stupid or I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to yeah. let him have it. Yeah. Because uh, he's not, I'm not going to cuss or anything like that, because I'm firmly against, I don't believe in drinking or smoking or cussing. There's a lot of things that Christians, fundamentalists, support I agree with when it comes to morality a bit. They think there's, this is where I split with the humanist type people and the atheist people and join the fundamentalists. Yeah. I think the TV is filled up with filth and violence and trash and garbage. I could agree with them more. So and uh, and it's just the track record of, of seeing what the you know Madeline O'Hare and people like that. They've got so much negative feedback from her. I constantly hear from people. Uh, they don't like her. They can't get along with her. Yeah. She does yeah. more to destroy what she's doing with her attitude or behavior yeah, or so attack. She's uncivil. Yeah. She just, uh, when Jerry Falwell had to pick an atheist to represent the other side, he couldn't do better, couldn't do better than picking her. Just the mm. image she projects. You want your children to grow up and like, be like somebody like that. You know, cocky, arrogant, insolent, disrespectful, uh -huh. the whole nine yards. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, she's playing right in their hands. Dan Barker's a nice representative. Yeah, I agree. I felt my trip to Ohio was well worth it. In subsequent years, Dennis and I kept in touch. I would often send him tapes that I myself made of my informal debates with Christians, and he would critique them. Another one thing they're pulling on you is this copy is crap defense. Something was copied wrong. Yeah. Here's what you see on that one. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. This is one lone scribe back in the alcove somewhere screwing up. You've got 5,000 5, separate manuscripts, and when they translate a version of the Bible, I mean, they're creating these versions like the King James or whatever, they're using manuscripts that purport to be accurate representations of the originals. The originals no longer exist. Everybody agrees with that. Nobody argues that point. You're, these manuscripts, when they sit down to write these versions, they're looking at hundreds of manuscripts. 
They're not sitting around looking two or three. So for this error to be in here, this is an error, then hundreds of copyists made the same mistake. They not, they not, only, all, they not only did all of them screw up, but they all screw up exactly the same way. You know what's interesting? What you're doing is precisely what needs to be done. I made a speech about, uh, before the American Rationalist Convention, about seven, eight years ago, when I outlined we need an organization of people doing exactly what you're doing, and they need to meet periodically and compare notes of what mm. works, what doesn't work, and so forth, you know, have conventions, yeah. and do the research, yeah. and go out and meet people like you're doing. Yeah. We need plenty of people doing what you're doing. Yeah. This is exactly, yeah. you're right on the money. Yeah. You're making some mistakes that, you know, there's, a, of course, I'd make mistakes and I argue with them too, but yeah. we, you know, we all learn, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, you learn as you go along. But what you're doing has far more potential and possibility than anything I've ever seen yeah. Yeah, by far. Mark the fundamentalist. Oh, he, right. he was, like, very, very assertive. <laughs> yeah, I noticed uh, that. Although, although, you know, my, my opinion is that, that, all that assertiveness works against him. I think people listening to it will say, this, this guy's getting on my nerves because he's, he's talking down to, to me. <laughs> all yeah, the time. you tend to put up with people patronizing you a lot. I yeah, notice. I do, I do. Uh, <laughs> it's my style. You're much more uh, amenable to that than I am. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've almost been, God, my gosh, break you, they're making your brow beating you there. Yeah. You? <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's my talent. I look at it positively. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I noticed. Uh, yeah, it uh, takes me it takes me a while to really uh, it, get get upset by it. Yeah, I noticed you keep your cool even when a real guy's really coming down on you. Oh. His language got a little strong there at times. To, to, to see, it basically it's a boxing match. When you go out in the ring, the first thing you got to do is punch that guy right in the nose. You got to get his respect. He's got to know, my God, this guy's got some power, and then you intimidate him. And then we'll he isn't see. so sure. But see, what, when you start out with weaker arguments and he knocks this one off, takes care of that one, yeah. the time you're halfway through, you think, well, this Mickey's a piece of cake. I mean, hey, wait, well, wait, 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 wait. Remember Muhammad Ali? Huh? Remember Muhammad Ali against George Foreman? He, he, he laid against the ropes and took all kinds of punishment and finally knocked out Foreman. <laughs> that, that's my style. I like to finish strong. <laughs> you think rope a dope a do it, eh? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm about 15 on that. <laughs> That, that I, is, I, that, believe, I think you go out there with your uh, your fists flying, and uh, the hardest stuff you got hits them right up front. Mm. And boy, they back off, and then they, they get their respect, and they don't mess with you anymore. And mm. uh, and then uh, and you can only do that with very simple, direct, blatant. You had him. In fact, a couple of times you really nailed that guy, and you went off immediately to something else. I'm sitting there thinking, No, no, Nicky, don't go to that other thing. You got him right now. Stay with it. Mm. Pin that guy to the floor. Nail him to the wall. But you went to another topic, and the guy just, whew, he's probably thinking to himself, no, I beat that rap, because he knows he was caught, you know what I mean? And yeah. you were just too, uh. you're too nice, and you just let the guy, I don't know whether you did it uh, intentionally or accidentally or what, but... Yeah, I do, well, when, yeah, when I think I've made the point, I, I, yeah. mm. you, you say to, to nail him, I, I, to me, it's sort of like rubbing it in, it's, to me, it's, uh, you know, I think he knows I made that point, and, uh... Yeah, but you didn't make him say uncle. Yeah. Did, well, see, I don't... He, he did. You did at the end. Yeah. When you brought those... Uh, how do you get this 36 names, only 29, or what is it, seven names, only five? That math yeah. stuff I mentioned. Yeah. Uh, you got him there. Right, right. And uh, several others you got. See, that because the way you got him is you deal with very simple, blatant, obvious, non-involved, strictly facts, no opinions, there's no way to interpret or take out of context. Boy, they use that argument up the... Uh, what you ought to do that out of context crap is just mention the fact... I, show me the context I'm taking it out of. Yeah, yeah. You know, what is it around it that changes what I'm saying? And if you press him on them, you, you know, you've got him nailed to the wall. But if you're going to be... Uh, if you're too much Mr. Nice Guy, this, those guys are slicing at you a lot. But and that you, you one, don't that think that last guy? He was coming on pretty. Hey, well, I'd like to been there and talk with him. Boy, he and I'd have had a Downey Brook. Get down to that math deal again. Yeah. You got to make him say uncle a bunch of times. He yeah, I'm going to go that. research that stuff. And he said, I'll have to. Yeah, see that? Yeah, that's that's where I want to catch him. I'm, I'm going to do the research from my from my point of view from, right. from what he asked. Right. And I'm going to say what I think, and then I'm going to ask, okay, now how did where did you 
find out further about slavery and about this, this mixed up numbers here. And then he's going to say, oh, well, I didn't get around to that. <laughs> Editorial comment. And that's exactly what happened. He did not research the issue and come up with a viable answer. Every Christian I have ever stymied on a particular point and who said they would research it and get back to me did not do so. Did not do so. That is enormously telling. And incidentally, that includes Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible answer man, after my six-hour discussion with him. Well, I'll tell you another one where you had him. was on slave deals. Yeah. You can't nail him on the wall on that slave deal. He might as well pack it in. Yeah. There are so many verses in there that support. And when you brought that one up in the book of Leviticus about uh, buying and selling, yeah. you decked him on that one. Yeah. That's one of the few times I could tell the guy's been floored. I mean, just like he's on the mat, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's staring up at the lights, the ceiling, you know. And uh, you did a good job on that. Yeah. That was great. I love those. I'm sitting there just giggling my because <laughs> I know you. He's what he's doing. He's sitting there fast, his, his mind can move, trying to think of an answer, you know. Yeah. And he's going down through all the possibilities of arguments he can use yeah. to circumvent what you just presented to him, yeah. and all of them are fall, falling flat. And you don't want to bring them out because you know you can chop them down easily. You know what I mean? So he says he's going to further research it. Yeah, then he'll, right. He'll wrap it up and say he'll further research, which means I think a lot of everything I can possibly think of, and I can't think of it. Yeah, that, 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 that's why I, I, that guy I definitely want to get back again for, <laughs> for one more uh, meeting with him. Yeah, I'll be sure to record that. I want yeah. to hear that, sir. Yeah. Well, as I say, what you're doing is great, and I, I only wish more people were doing it, and because yeah. uh, you're going to get better and better at this as time goes along. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you're going to have heard some of this stuff before, and you'll think about what they've said. And, uh, you know, you'll come back with better answers next time. And the more research you do, the better you get at it. And, and uh, you actually get quite a bit above the average layman. And you actually get to where you're the only person that's even competition for you is a minister or a rabbi or somebody, you know, yeah. or a professor. Yeah. Because you get quite a bit beyond the uh, average Joe's knowledge of the book, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, but the main thing is uh, the effect you're having on these people. I think you're having an effect on every one of them, although they don't want to admit it. Yeah, I'm, they, they, they can't come away from a counter like that without having some of their stuff shaken. Okay, well, keep me posted, and, and uh, I'll get these tapes back to you as soon as I hear them. Okay. And uh, appreciate you sending them. Yep. Take care. Okay, good to talk to you. Sure yep. enough. Yep. Bye. Right. I hope people take Dennis's words to heart and interact more with Christians. Certainly an in-depth knowledge of the Bible and experience in debating Christians makes a big difference. But it's not strictly necessary. Get yourself a Bible, maybe a free one from a local church or from the Internet. Pick out a few key passages and use your own logic. A third grader can see what's wrong with certain passages. Don't start with, hey, you know, I think your religion is wrong, but rather, so you're a Christian, huh? You know, there's some passages in the Bible I came across that really disturb me. C can you explain these to me? In other words, start with a soft approach, but then eventually press the issue. It can be frustrating because they're so brainwashed, but it often turns out to be fun and very intellectually gratifying, being a warrior for common sense. My best debating tip is this. When you find a passage that says 2 plus 2 equals 5, or that slavery is okay, stick to that passage. Don't let the Christian move you to another passage that may say 2 and 2 equals 4, or that slavery is not okay. Don't let the Christian ignore the bad passage and focus only on the good passage. That is what they like to do. An allegedly sacred book should not contain any significant bad passages, contradictions, or immoralities. So, Dennis McKenzie, thank you for your work. You have made your mark. And I think as the years go on, your approach, the biblical critique approach, using the Bible against itself, will become more and more influential in replacing archaic religious ideas with a more sensible worldview.